Uh, my name is Xing Ye, and I'm from Jerry Trans Lab and Boston University here. I'm not sure if Ryan like arranged it on purpose because uh, we're uh, like a kilohertz to photon microscope and we're actually using the denoising algorithm that's derived a lot from the deep interpolation. So maybe Jerome will be like interesting how the algorithm is applied to the voltage indicators and how it helps us like actually uh, identify those uh, uh, spikes. So I'm happy to take any questions. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop or just kind of, yeah. I, I will try to follow the channel questions, but it might be easier if you just kind of get in and, and speak out, yeah. So we're, so it's on the title that I'm introducing this kilohertz to photon microscope that we developed in the lab. So what, why do we need a kilohertz to photon microscope? So the idea is because we're having, we're seeing the development of those genetically encoded voltage indicators and compared to the calcium indicators, they're having a really fast transient uh, to the uh, action potential. So we, if we're just looking at those on the shelf to photon microscope, that's only like uh, tens of frame, tens of frames per second. That's not, it's not fast enough. So we want to have a faster two photon microscope. And when we're looking at going faster, and if we still want a large field of view, we're facing this trade of like, if we want it larger then because the two photon images are quite sequentially, uh, there will be less pulses per neuron that we can get. So that's kind of uh, a trade off that we need to face. And the solution that we took is just using parallel beams. So each beam, if we can provide a subframe and we tie up those subframes, then we can enlarge the field of view looking at more neurons simultaneously. But if we're looking at each frame, the, uh, the scanning and excitation properties of that single beam is not sacrificed. So there are two categories of doing this beam multi multiplexing. The first one is just simply spatial multiplexing, just split the beam and uh, steer it at where you want it and make an array so that, and use a multi-anode PMT or use a CCD camera as the detector. And when we're using this strategy, the one thing that we need to be really careful about is the distance between the two beams, especially when we are looking at deeper into the tissue because, uh, they're scattering effect. So if we go to deep and if they're too close together, then the excited or the emitted photon from the two photon effect will get scattered and will get mixed at the detection site. So the crosstalk is what we are facing and that's not what we want. So just be careful about the distance. That's the one limitation of the spatial multiplexing. And the second category is the temporal multiplexing. So the idea is that we, if we look at the pulse lasers that we use for two photon, there is a, there's this uh, pulse interval that we're looking at. And for example, in this laser is 32 nanosecond. And if we're looking at the detected fluorescent signal, the lifetime of fluorescence is normally at a few nanoseconds. So there's like a, a space that we can take advantage of. So the idea is, Split the beams and then add different lengths of delay line to each uh, to each beam, just as shown in this figure, so that when we're looking at a detected signal, we'll be able to tell the difference or tell apart signals from different area by just looking at arrival time. So and that and that in that strategy, we don't have to worry about the spatial crosstalk because signals from different areas are arriving at different times. So it can be on mix by using the digital demultiplexing. So this is another microscope that I've developed in the lab. And that's the goal of this, and my microscope is different, but it's the same, it's using a similar strategy. So this is kind of looking at four different sub areas and the mouse cortex. And uh, simultaneously I'm looking at a large like kind of field of view. So the idea of this kilohertz system 
is that I want to combine these two strategies together to get a higher frame rate. Because for spatial, we cannot get things too close together. So we go, there's only a certain number of themes that we can use. And for temporal, also, if you look at this figure, you would say there's only like certain number of pulses that we can actually fit in to the pulse interval. So the system we are now, we have now developed is a four by two beam multiplexing system. So four is four times temporal. So we use this 32 nanosecond interval laser again, and it's split into four, just shown here in four different colors. So we add delay line to each one of them with different length so that each, uh, so uh, the two, between the two areas, the interval is eight nanosecond. And for each color, which means for each beam that has the same time, we split it further into two. So for example, here we see one A and one B. So they arrive at the sample at the same time, but they're split, split spatially. So the, the total field of view we're designing is a 400 by 400 micron field of view. So we have eight beams here. So each stripe is 50 by 400. So we can see that how the frame rate is increased by eight times in that way. And for the detection side here, we're using this multi anode PMT. So it's a PMT, so it's fast enough for us to do the digital demultiplexing, which means tell apart the different colors, not colors, but like a different arrival time. And also because it's multi anode, like 1A and 1B, even if arrive at the same time, because it's Alan, it arrive at different anodes, we'll be able to tell them apart. An important thing here is that if you look at 1A and 1B, they are 200 microns away from each other in the sample. So that will be enough for us to do it, uh, to, to image at deeper layers in the cortex and without having to worry about the crosstalk. So this is like a schematic of the system. And, uh, and here is the mechanical design. So it's like a pretty huge system. And those uh, rays, uh, those rails are those delay lines that we designed. And if we look at here, we have two beam splitting plates. So what it did is to split the beam from with, of the same time arrival to two. And, and, and you need to carefully design it in a way so that those eight beams are aligned in the line and when it arrives at the sample. So another thing to mention about the system that it has a quick switch here to switch between eight beam and one beam mode. So that when we, we need to, when we need a high speed mode, I'll switch to the eight beam system and do it uh, and do the uh, fast imaging. And when we, when I need only one beam, and when, when I want to devote more power into one beam and to do two, uh, uh, two color imaging, I'm also a, I will also be able to, like, to quickly switch to the one beam mode so that I can have like two colors and also do that imaging. So this is the mechanical design and uh, so this is an average image that we got, that I got from our system. So you can see that there's eight stripes and it's tied up and the frame rate we, call, we currently, currently uh, achieve is 800 frames per second. That's an average frame. And we can see we're able to image like 100 neurons at the same time. But if we look at a single frame, you see how noisy is this? It's because this is like eight beams and we're devote, we're separating the, the powers, distributing the powers. And also because the frame rate is 800. So you can see how noisy it is if you look at the single frame. So here is when the deep interpolation comes. So it's, we kind of having, we collaborated with uh, Lei Chance Lab from Boston University. Uh, we are combining the deep interpolation and uh, the noise to void ice. 
So the idea is that first, we're having, we, we want a fast system. So we want to take the most, of, we take the advantage of this fast transient. So there are only, we cannot use 30 frames before and 30 frames after because we tried that. And I, we could see how the fast transient of the voltage indicator is actually smeared. So actually we only using three frames before and three frames after. And um, that's the, the, the best kind of, uh, the best uh, number of frames that we, uh, like after those experiments think it's the best. And also uh, we also like add up, add upon it uh, noise to avoid so that uh, besides the frames before and after, it, the, the model will also take, in, take into consideration the frame itself and try to predict the blind spots that chosen uh, randomly so that the spatial resolution is actually a little bit improved after this like combination. So just to show the result, so the first, they have three images here. The first one is the average, the average image that is raw, that before the noising. And the second stripe is single frame raw. And the third stripe is single frame denoised. You can see how much the denoising is improving this resolution. And after, so, so like the, the raw data is like a pure noise, if you just look at my eye, but after the noise, you can, you can see how it improved. And also, if you look at the traces that are extracted from the cell that I've encircled, you can see how this, the gray, gray line, the noise that's shown here is suppressed after the noising, and how those uh, events or spikes are actually, the death nerve is improved after that. So if you look at the raw data, uh, if you look at the average traces of all those events that we extracted, you can see the delta F over F is also improved after that. So here's the denoising algorithm. And uh, uh, the here, oh, and one thing that I need to mention. So this, this is a behavior kind of experiment where we performed on mice that the stimulus that we're using here is shown in red. So we just kind of put the air pump to the mouse uh, whiskers. So to kind of just generate a, like more global stimulus uh, while we're looking at symmetric sensory cortex. So it's just like uh, air pumps is one, five, one, five inter, interleaving. Uh, so this is a uh, activity, it's like a more global uh, it's, 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 oh, it's, the, uh, oh, it's a detected activities from all 129 neurons that we can see in one field of view. And uh, the threshold is four because we are having a pretty low uh, SNR overall. So this is the uh, events that we extracted from uh, all those 100 neurons. And from the plot on the right, you can see that if the raw data that's shown in the black line, when we're looking at a lower SNR threshold, is actually giving a lot of false positive. That is like, it's detecting the noise as the, the activity. And if we're increasing the threshold, we can see how the, the noise data is actually keeping uh, those uh, activities that we want at a relatively higher SNR level. So this is a, like a general idea of like uh, how this denoising algorithm that we're using is improving the detection rate and increasing, uh, improving the quality of our images. So another collaboration we're having is to collaborate with the voltage indicator developers and we collaborate with Vincent Pierbon's lab from Yale University and they have developed this new uh, uh, voltage indicators that derived from an ASAP. So there are two versions of this. So the blue one is an, 
a normal like ASAP version, which just means it's the fluorescent level goes down when there is an action potential because the action potential means the memory potential is goes uh, closer to zero. So the fluorescence goes down when there is an action potential. And we also have this inverted version of spike EG, which means the fluorescent level goes up when we are seeing an action potential. So this is uh, the experiment that uh, Allison and our lab performed on a slice, uh, on a brain slice as the in vitro uh, EFIS. And you can see how the spike GI is actually having a better uh, delta F over F. And also, and if you look at the action potential, it's actually a pretty similar responses uh, in terms of the absolute value. So this is uh, the new voltage indicators that we have and from Kirbon's lab. So we try this voltage indicators in vivo. So we did the same experiment as, as I mentioned before. So it's just air pubs to whiskers. And if you can see, you can see here, interesting thing that we noticed that is we're having a much better responses with the inverted version compared to the non-inverted version, even if they're not that different in vitro. I think the main proper uh, reason is that in vivo, as I said, it's a pretty low photon flux condition. It's because, uh, because we are having pretty low uh, uh, laser power compared to the in vitro, and also because of the high frame rate, the the like negative going, which is not inverted, the negative going signals are more likely to be buried in those photon and in the photon in the photon shot noise uh, at this low uh, flux kind of condition. But that's it's just kind of an assumption of why we're seeing this. And another thing that on the right side you can see that this is like the average trace that we extracted from each, uh, so we have five pubs, uh, like uh, five hertz air pubs and 10 hertz air pubs. So we only average those traces that has the detected event at the certain air pub. So we can see how this fast microscope and how the fast voltage indicators can really keep the good uh, temporal resolution in terms of those fast uh, kind of uh, neural activities if we compare with those calcium indicators. And uh, so another thing that we also tested is that uh, if this, if those indicators or if our microscope system can keep on running for longer time, long-term uh, behavior experiments. So we performed this uh, imaging for a, Six, uh, 16 minutes and a run. So we, uh, so the way that we're tr looking at those photo bleachings that we're doing this like nine second of imaging and four second of rest, which is like a very normal uh, or, or typical kind of uh, uh, length of imaging that we normally did in our lab for those like task related behavior experiments. So nine, nine seconds of imaging, four seconds rest, and we just kind of let it run for 60 minutes. And you can see on the up right corner, you see uh, there is a lot of bleaching on those voltage indicators, like 20% of it. But if you look at the traces on the left, that even after 60 minutes of imaging, we can still be able to see those uh, event evoked action potential as well. So that's kind of, uh, prove that this is sustainability of our system and those voltage indicators that we're using. So, and uh, yeah, that's all for what I want to introduce today. And I would like to thank uh, my colleagues in the lab, especially Allison, uh, for like performing those in vitro uh, uh, science reportings and uh, those animals uh, surgeries. So, that's all, and uh, just leave like 10 seconds for you to, if you have any questions.
Ai Xin. Yeah. A really nice presentation. I'm, I'm glad you're applying this to voltage. Um, I have a question. So it it um, it does seem that the denoising is uh, is still not recovering the full spatial resolution, right? Uh, so yes, so it, it it it's likely compromising spatial resolution for the sake of reconstructing the trace. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I wonder if you thought about uh, how much more improvement in, in the voltage indicator is required to uh, recover that spatial information. Uh, you mean improve? You mean want to recover that? Well, it, it, if, I think if it's compromising spatial a resolution it probably means that it's, it does the photon flux is still too low to to reconstruct yeah. the the spatial and so um, I'm just trying to speculate uh, how much order of magnitude improvement do we still need from the voltage indicator to actually reach uh, uh, the full resolution. Uh, if you want a number, I might not having it. It's more like a. Yeah, there's like two ways. Uh, maybe and in theory, we might be able to improve a little bit more on the laser power. And also we definitely want a better voltage indicator, but there is such certain limit that we can actually get from that. There's only such certain number of molecules that we can put on a membrane. And also there's this bleaching thing that we need to face. So, but you, yeah, could, it's, you could do an experiment to get out of that, right? Sort of uh, have a little more laser power shortly change the photon flux. So then you can control the photon flux and and plot the regime that you need to reach to, to recover the spatial information. Uh, and, and that would sort of give you an insight about oh. how far we still need to go. Yeah, that's a good idea. Just kind of... Yeah, we're kind of already pushing the limit of our current system in terms of laser power. So that might be, I'm not sure if there are any like simulations that might be also helpful in terms of, yeah. I've seen this in calcium, like when SNR gets really, really low, I've seen mm -hmm. this network, they start to compromise space. Yes. And, and so like space is maintained, maintained, and then at some point it drops so that it, it, has, to, it has to average locally. And, uh, I think there are ways to, yeah, as you said. Yeah, and also it. because maybe it's like the limited numbers of frames that we're using because we wanted to keep that fast transient. So only use few frames that might also like compromising the spatial resolution if I understand it properly. Thank you. Thank you.